right, so we will get started. It's a little bit after five. I wanna thank Shane for joining us. Um, this was a short notice, but he was able to be flexible. Thank God for virtual world. Um, <laughs> it kind of helps with that. Um, so for those of you who don't know Shane, um, he is a fourth grade teacher um, and elementary classroom teacher. And he is also engaged in um, various efforts to fight racism, promote equity, foster cultural responsive social studies curriculum throughout Monroe County. Um, he's actively working with um, Path Stones right now on a county curriculum. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong later on, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Past on Foundation, yes. Past on Foundation. Um, so I had the privilege of watching um, Shane's presentation last year, um, and I thought this would be the best time for him to come in and present for the PTSA. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna let Shane take it over. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, what I'm really hoping to do is share a little bit um, about the research that I've done um, in our community, the way that I've worked with uh, my fourth graders over the last eight years, um, as well as hundreds of students in Rochester schools, Webster, West Arondequoit, um, and across Rush Henrietta, and hopefully in the future in Pittsburgh. So um, uh, what else do I wanna say before I get going? Well, I guess the first thing I'll say is this. Um, this project initially started about eight years ago um, when one of my students in fourth grade, a little nine-year-old, asked me during Martin Luther King Day at school um, if racism was a problem in Rochester and if segregation was a problem and if people had, had fought against it here. And I grew up in Webster, going, went to Webster schools my whole life, and I had no answer. I didn't know who Dr. Cooper was. I didn't know that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X had come here. I'd never heard who the first black principal of Rochester schools was, Alice Young. I didn't know these people's names. I didn't know that Webster was whites only in Pittsburgh. I, I didn't know about redlining, all these different things. And so what I told my, my fourth grader, I said, I know Rochester has a problem with segregation, but what I don't know is how that happened. And I don't know who fought it, but I try to be a good teacher. And so I said, you know what? I'm gonna try to look into it and answer your questions. Luckily, I was also getting my master's in childhood multicultural education at Geneseo, um, and that provided me a great avenue to be able to start looking into these things. And that led me to a life um, filled with activist work, especially in the housing arena in the city of Rochester, focused uh, especially on permanently affordable community controlled housing with City Roots Community Land Trust, um, as well as the Beachwood neighborhood, connected communities, and uh, also the Police Accountability Board Alliance. And getting to do that work learning from activists from the past who are still active today um, informed a ton of the work that you're going to see here today and this presentation is called racist policy and resistance in rochester and this is a picture from 1962 on the right here um, that exemplifies that resistance the reverend gibson from ame zion leading a march of 300 people to city hall demanding the arrest of the police officers who beat um, an african-american man named rufus farewell uh, for uh, locking up the gas station that he owned. They thought he was robbing it. And we'll talk more about his story as we go. And on the left, you can see Rochester's redlining map that resulted from federal policy um, that led to massive investment in white wealth and disinvestment and segregation in black communities. So let's keep going here though. My sources, the things that I'm gonna really uh, pull from today as well as interviews that I've done and conversations with folks in the community, I'm gonna draw quite a bit from The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. About two years ago, I started partnering with the Pathstone Foundation and Stuart Mitchell and uh, the incredible folks over there in uh, talking about this work and how it might connect to affordable housing. And uh, we got to work together to bring Richard Rothstein to Rochester last summer. I got to meet him. He actually read this whole presentation. He's vetted it. He found two mistakes. I had a date off by a year and I misspelled a Supreme Court justice's name wrong in the speaker notes. It's fixed, it's Rothstein approved, watch out. Also, uh, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination from 1958, um, as well as the Rochester Voices Project, part of the public library, uh, with countless interviews um, from civil rights leaders in Rochester, as well as a whole bunch that you'll see from the Democrat and Chronicle archives. 
Oh, my computer's being funky. Here we go. And then I want to reference some definitions that I'll be using throughout the presentation. These are also the definitions I use with my students from Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. He defines racism as a marriage of racist policies and racist ideas that produces and normalizes racial inequalities. Notice in his definition of racism, it doesn't talk about good or bad intentions. It doesn't talk about how good your heart is. It doesn't talk about the times. It's just policies and ideas that normalize racial inequalities. Racist policies are any measures that produce or sustain racial inequity between racial groups. And what I think is one of the most important things is anti-racist policy. And in fact, the curriculum that I've been developing with Pathstone is called the anti-racist um, curriculum. Um, because what we wanna do is not be not racist, which isn't really a thing. What we want to do is make sure that we're actively trying to correct racist policies by creating anti-racist policies or measures that produce and sustain racial equity between racial groups that have to do with laws, procedures, regulations, or things like curriculum, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so before we begin, I think it's uh, really important to center ourselves and recognize as well that the conversation we're going to have is an uncomfortable one. Um, it's one that for me as a white person, the more and more I learned about this, uh, the more defensive I felt, the more it challenged the story that my family and myself had told ourselves about how, where our wealth came from and the reasons that we had prospered as a family. And it kind of started to challenge some of those narratives and we had a choice. Um, and so I wanna read this quote and in those moments of discomfort or where you feel sort of some defensiveness coming up or that can't be true, I just wanna challenge you to remember this moment. D'Angelo writes, the key to moving forward is what do we do with our discomfort? We can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? And most importantly, what would it mean for me if this were true? There we go. So to begin though, let's focus on our community here in Rochester. Everybody knows we're the home of Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, the great writer and orator who felt more at home here than anywhere else in the country as well as a lesser known Austin Stewart, who was actually enslaved right down the road from Rochester in Bath and later Sotus, New York, escaped to Canandaigua, got his education, became the first black business owner in the city of Rochester, opened a grocery store, which underneath it was a spot on the Underground Railroad, as well as the first school that black children were allowed to attend in the city of Rochester. There's so much more that we could talk about with him. In Pittsford, home of great uh, civil rights uh, people like Judge, Judge Ashley Simpson, um, who uh, in uh, Pittsford here at the Hargis Briggs House actually ran a stop in the oven in the basement for the Underground Railroad. Great suffragists and freedom fighters like Susan B. Anthony, who fought for the right to vote as well as incredible innovators, uh, geniuses like um, George Eastman, uh, who has left a huge legacy on Rochester, some of which though is a little more complicated than we always, than, than, than that we always talk about. Um, also related to Pittsburgh is the Reverend Dr. James H. Evans Jr., who is the first black president of Colgate, as well as the first black member of Oak Hill in the late 1970s. Now we have these great figures, these great folks, we have this legacy of, of, of people who fought for freedom, for abolition, for civil rights, um, for voting rights, and we have this legacy of great innovators, but we also have this legacy of injustice and incredible disparity. And I hope that we can take that spirit of fighting for freedom, that spirit of ingenuity and innovation, and as we learn about some of this history, we're able to take that and use it to lead us forward into creating and building a better and more just Rochester. But first, we have to talk about where we're at right now. And then 2017 Act Rochester Hard Facts Report, there's some pretty staggering statistics. They find that African-American children in our region are more than four times as likely as white children to live in poverty, and that both African-Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own home as their white counterparts. How do we get to a place like that? Where when you look at the census map of Rochester, where every dot represents one person and a blue dot represents one white person, you see a sea of blue representing Rochester's suburbs and a sea of green and a crescent shape representing Rochester's inner city, specifically the previously redlined areas by the federal government. When we look at our school systems, New York schools are the most segregated schools in the entire country and Rochester schools, especially the line between Rochester and Penfield, is the nation's number one most segregating school district border in the entire country. Let that sink in, that that is the community that we live in. 
And the only reason that it's not Pittsford is because um, there's a town in between Pittsford and the city, so it's not the most segregating line. Um, we also have uh, things like uh, an attempt in, in Pittsburgh to diversify, to modernize the curriculum. I'm sure there's more signatures than this now, but I was really excited when I saw this work being done by some former Pittsburgh students. We also have problems when it comes to curriculum in Pittsburgh and across our entire county. I'm sure many of you have uh, seen these images um, that were put up at Park Road Elementary School um, for Black History Month. They clearly don't represent Black history. And while a small example, a representative of a larger problem that we see in Rush Henrietta that I saw growing up in Webster, that I think are indicative of just a larger issue when it comes to racism and racist policy in our community. We also have huge problems across our area when it comes to life expectancy. Ibram Kendi says that white privilege is literally life itself. And in our community, a, a child in Pittsburgh's 14534 zip code, which is majority white, born today will live up to nine to 10 years longer than a child from Rochester's previously redlined 14608 zip code. Literally, white privilege is life itself and wealth. Um, in 2011, the New York Times found that the median white household had a net worth of $111,000 compared to $7,000 of median black household net worth. We also have problems um, when it comes to a history of policing and police brutality and discrimination against people of color. You can see Rufus Farewell, who's sitting in a wheelchair that he's in because of an encounter with the police when locking up his gas station. This was one of the inciting incidents of the 1964 uprising in Rochester. And uh, we can connect these events in Rochester that happened all over the country to the protests associated with the killing of George Floyd and these big protests that we've seen across our community, both in Pittsburgh and downtown. So what can we do? Kind of the central message of this comes from James Baldwin. This whole presentation, I would say, could be summed up by this quote. He says that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And what I want to challenge all of you to do today is to face specifically the racist policies and institutions at a state, federal, and local level that have led to the disparities and injustices um, that we see across racial lines in our community here in Rochester and of course across our country. So as we move forward though, I think it's really important to notice that people of color, since Austin Stewart and Frederick Douglass in Rochester have always spoken out. They have always chosen to face these issues head on. It's been the white community. It's been me and my family and my, grandpa my grandparents that chose to ignore these things in the Rochester community. And I hope you'll join me today facing these things and being a part of ameliorating them to build a better community. Meet Howard Coles, the editor of the black newspaper on Clarissa Street in the third ward of the Frederick Douglass Voice. And in 1938, he did a massive housing study. He found that black people in Rochester were forced to live in just two neighborhoods and that real estate agent banks and city government was leading this segregation movement. He found that in those two neighborhoods, um, there were over 30% of the apartment units did not have running water in them. On places like Portland Avenue, almost none of the homes had heat. Um, oftentimes outhouses in the backyard, water in the basements. He spoke out, he went to city hall, he organized protests and yet largely these things fell on deaf, ear, deaf ears. There are huge problems at U of R where I'm sure some many people in this room work, including myself, I'm actually an adjunct instructor in neurology and uh, doing some of this similar work and we've been grappling with that over there at U of R. Um, dean Whipple, uh, who won the, Paul, or the Nobel Prize, um, in fact, he was the first dean at the medical school, and he actively refused to allow black applicants, and was even cited in the New York State Commission on uh, the people of color in urban populations, um, citing that they wouldn't accept black students because they would have to um, examine white women during their obstetric rounds. Um, and it wasn't until Dr. Lunsford, the first black doctor in Rochester, who did not attend U of R, um, who fought a 10 to 15 year campaign with the NAACP, trying to force U of R to let students of color in. And in about 1949, he successfully got one black nursing student and one black doctor student um, to be admitted to the school 
by forcing New York State to take away uh, the tax exempt status of U of R. So an incredible hero there. Also, some people don't know this, but Strong Hospital had a segregated nursery for black women, separate from the nicer nursery for white women up until the 1960s. In fact, Dr. Walter Cooper, um, in an interview with myself, he, he described what this was like uh, when he went to go see his wife, Helen. He says, I go over to Strong Memorial Hospital and find my wife, had given birth on a segregated ward. It was separate, but not equal. And as soon as my wife Helen and I returned home, we vowed never to use Strong Hospital again. Dr. Anthony Jordan, the second black doctor in Rochester, did all kinds of studies relating health disparities and housing um, to higher death rates, just like the work that Wade Norwood and others at Common Ground Health are doing today, finding that in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes is 50% higher than that of whites, and the tuberculosis death rate among people of color in Rochester is two and one half times that of whites. I want to notice really quickly, I didn't use the word that he used that would have been acceptable in 1942, but it's 2020 and is a white person today, I'm not going to say that word. When I teach this with students, I always highlight words like that word um, and other words that are no longer respectful and point out to kids, these are words that we're not going to read out loud, but these are part of our primary sources from the past. And so what I want to do is to talk about how Rochester got so segregated. What were the specific policies that these civil rights heroes were fighting and directly facing head on, specifically in the real estate industry, through restrictive covenants, redlining, and the National Housing Act of 1930 and the VA and FHA backed mortgages that they created for white families. I want to talk about urban renewal, displacement, and the building of highways, and the exclusionary suburban zoning that exists in Pittsburgh, Penfield, and Webster still to this day. And hopefully, we can look at these policies, we can understand how these things better came to be, and then we can work together to dismantle the racism in our communities today, educate our children, and be a part of building a community that we can be proud to live in. In 1910 to 1970, the period that we're going to talk about is called the Great Migration. That's where much of this presentation will focus. This is when millions of African Americans fled the South um, because of domestic terrorism from the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Councils, because of the segregation down there, the lack of voting rights and land owning rights. And an interesting note is that a majority of people of color who came to Rochester during the Great Migration came from Sanford, Florida. And they didn't come here to work at Kodak because in fact, Kodak wouldn't hire people of color until the late 50s and early 60s when they were sort of forced to. Neither would Bausch and Lomb and neither would Xerox. Instead, they picked fruit. And since they weren't allowed to live in the suburbs where they picked that fruit or those rural areas, they would take the train in to live in the third and seventh ward of Rochester, which we'll talk about in a second. I just had a little technical difficulty here. Hold on. All right. Oh, that's better. Now, the next, th the first thing we want to talk about is the real estate industry. This is really where codified segregation starts happening, specifically in the north. Now, in Rochester, governing real estate agents still to this day is the National Association of Real Estate Boards. They've changed their name to something else, but they're still part of the National Association. And now, for 30 years until 1956, they had a code of ethics. And on the front page of the code of ethics, it says, our goal is to follow the golden rule of do unto others as you would do unto yourself. And as you go down the list of what that means for a real estate agent, it includes this statement, which was read until 1956 as law. And enforced by this man on the right, Frank Drum, the president of Rochester's real estate board. It read, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality or any individuals whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. When Howard Coles, who you met earlier, of the Frederick Douglass Voice, went to fight against this racist policy, he got his real estate license and began to show people of color homes in white neighborhoods and suburbs. Immediately, though, he was taken to task by the real estate board and pushed out of his job as a real estate agent. The Coopers faced this issue as well when they came to Rochester. Walter Cooper writes, I confronted housing segregation. It was 1954. The wife and I answered ads for 69 apartments, and we were refused at all of them. One of those apartments was owned by Amico and Farish, uh, Max Farish, many of you may know that name, Farish, um, and they denied Dr. Cooper and his wife, who was a doctor of chemistry, um, to be able to live in one of the suburban apartments because of their skin color. 
as well as every single other apartment complex. It wasn't until a black family off of Webster Avenue was willing to allow them to rent in their apartment that they found somewhere to live, even though they could have afforded to live anywhere. Dr. Alice Young in 1957, she was the first black principal in the city of Rochester School District. And what she decided is that she wanted more room for her son Rodney and her other kids to be able to play. Now, the unfortunate thing was is that she went to every real estate agency in town, including Frank Drum's Alliance Realty, Knopf Nagel, and others, and none of them would show Alice and James a home because they were black, and they explicitly told that to them. And in fact, Alice and I have had lunch several times. She even wrote a book about her experiences with this, and it's, it's quite a story that I can't do justice in just this short time. But what she did was what the 57 other people of color who during this time period were able to buy a home did. They found a white, wealthy friend, usually from the NAACP, like Mrs. Harper Sibley, where Pat Stone's uh, home offices are now. She was of the Western Union Telegraph fortune. And what Harper did is she bought a house sight unseen in the all-white 19th Ward for Alice and her husband. They didn't get to go in and see it before they bought it. They snuck in in the middle of the night with just a crib and a suitcase because they were uh, fearing for retribution. Sure enough, the next morning in their mailbox, you can read on the screen the incredibly terrifying note signed by the Ku Klux Klan of Millbank Street. And for years, uh, 17 years, they stayed in this home and they faced quite a bit of racial discrimination um, and pushback from the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Dr. Young, when I had lunch with her before quarantine, said that when I tell her story and tell my students her story, that she wants me to include the Bush family who is the one white family on Millbank Street that stood with them, that helped them get the FBI involved and would protect them when the Klan came a calling. Now, we don't often think of upstate New York as Klan country or Rochester, but there are several instances of huge Klan presence here. In fact, East Rochester was sort of where the, uh, the New York State Klan convocation would happen. In 1926, you can see 8,000 Klansmen gathered in East Rochester Field. John Ott's Field actually was his name. You can even see those Model Ts. Later, a uh, gathering of over 20,000 Klansmen. Regular cross burnings and people of colors, front lawns happened all the way up until the 1980s, specifically in Henrietta and Gates Chile that are some of our most integrated um, suburban areas. Areas. The next thing I want to talk about with racist policy is something called a restrictive covenant. To give you a little background, we all know like that very public symbol of segregation, the black and white water fountain in the South. Now, just as public but not as in your face symbol of segregation that was very effective at segregation is a racially restrictive covenant. Now, everyone who owns a home has a deed that says you own your house and on that deed there's restrictions. Many of those are good restrictions legally binding rules like you have to abide in your home quietly or you can't have a distillery in your backyard or like your neighbor can't have pigs in the backyard. Things we're glad about. But a thing that was the rage across the country and especially in Rochester was restrictions barring people of color from ever living in these neighborhoods and towns. The first place I wanna focus on, and I'm gonna show you quite a few places, is Brighton. Because the, the people that really ushered this in, it started here. In fact, the Meadowbrook neighborhood next to Brighton High School is described on its website as 371 homes, a first tier, carefully planned development. And it was so carefully planned that when Vice President of Kodak Realty Corporation and a founding member of ESL Bank founded um, the, this, the land and signed the deeds for every single property, he wrote this restriction. And these are all photographs I've taken from the county clerk's office. It says no lot or dwelling shall be sold to or occupied by a person of color. You can see it says Kodak there, it's signed by him, and this is all their properties. And they had five other suburban housing tracts around the county that had similar restrictions. Um, but another thing that's interesting is they actually advertised this in their um, brochures that they passed out. Advertising restricted owner lists as well as careful restrictions provide very desirable neighbors so that your kids will definitely have nice companions to play with. And for nice, we know what that means, that means just white. Um, and it's also interesting to note that during this time, Kodak did not hire black people. You might have heard me mention that earlier. They were in fact written up in the 1939 discrimination report by New York State. And it, it found that in Kodak, there were over 16,000 employees and one black porter that was employed. Bausch and Lomb was similar, um, as well as Xerox later on until the 60s. But Brighton continued with this. You can see Council Rock Estates that butts right up against Pittsburgh. All of those homes as well had these restrictions advertised in the paper as rigid restrictions you can see in the bottom left for desirable social character. Read white. 
Um, in Pittsburgh, several hundred homes have uh, these racially restrictive deeds as well in the East Avenue Estates neighborhood by Oak Hill Country Club that say no lot shall, this lot shall never be conveyed to or occupied by a person of color. You can see some of these homes, Kilborn, Shellwood, Crestline, um, and the area across the road that's by St. John Fisher too. You can see they were advertised in the paper as rigidly restricted home sites. But it's not just Pittsburgh, and that's just the first instance of these I found in Pittsburgh. We're actually engaged in a larger study with Yale Law School and the county clerk's office to uncover all of these restrictions across Monroe County um, and to make them public and to let people know who have them on their home still, even though they're no longer enforceable, but to make it public who has publicly disavowed them and make it clear who has not publicly disavowed their restrictive covenants. And also be able to overlay it with how a majority of these neighborhoods like East Avenue Estates are still like 95 to 99% white. This is West Irondequoit, almost all in Northwest Irondequoit, 2000 highly restricted lots. You can see the racial restriction right there. Gates, over 250 homes. Same with Greece, the Dewey Stone Track, Denise Road, Marwood. It's interesting here, you'll notice Italians are included in this one, um, and uh, it gets very specific in its language. Oftentimes, Jewish people uh, were denied homes as well during this period of time. Like in Fairport, in Forest Hills neighborhood, um, in fact, it read in the deeds, of course, people of color couldn't live there, um, or Italians or Polish people. But what's interesting is that if you're Italian or Polish, literally in the deed it said, like, if you've lived here for two successive generations, then you can buy a home in Forest Hill, even if you're Italian, um, because you've assimilated. Whereas if you're a person of color, that same stipulation doesn't apply. Rochester, all throughout Beechwood, where I live, the North Winton area, all throughout the Browncroft neighborhood have these same racial restrictions, as well as the 19th Ward, where Rochester's first black judge, Judge Reuben Davis, bought, tried to buy a home. He writes, my wife and I were looking for a house. It was 1958. We saw a house we liked on 135 Elm Dorth Ave in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee Street, which is one of those red lines that we'll see soon. I would say there were probably four black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee Street at that time. The owner refused to sell to us because we were black. And there was a restrictive covenant in the deed that these houses when built were not to be sold to people of color or to Italians. Now, very often I have Italian and Jewish folks come up to me after these presentations and say, um, you know, we were discriminated against, against too, like, right? Like it's just as bad for us. And I'll often say, of course, it was, terrible discrimination happened against Italian and Jewish people in the United States. But in 1944, the federal government passed the GI Bill. And if you were a veteran who was Italian or Jewish or Eastern European, automatically you were now given access to live in Green Line neighborhoods and get federally financed mortgages to live in those places, as well as those racial restrictions not applying to you if you wanted to live in those neighborhoods. Whereas if you were a black veteran who had fought in World War II, because of your skin color, you were not el eligible to receive a federally financed FHA mortgage or VA loan. Now, these are the places so far that I found the racial restrictive covenants around Rochester, just from maybe 10, 15 hours of putzing around the county clerk's office. Um, judging by our research in other cities, we expect a good 20 to 30,000 more covenants to surface as we really start to beef up that research. The next area of racist policy is the New Deal. So it's the wake of the Great Depression. There's a big housing crisis. There's a whole huge problem. So FDR, who formerly was the governor of New York State, um, is president, and he signs into law, along with Senator Wagner, again from New York State, really emphasizing two Northerners, signed into law the National Housing Act of 1934. It forever changes the landscape of the United States, especially the town of Pittsburgh. Because towns like Pittsburgh, I mean, they had five to 8,000 people living in them back in the 1930s and the 1920s. But the National Housing Act subsidizes over $119 billion of home construction and federally financed mortgages that allow the suburbs to balloon during this period of 30 to 40 years that this is enforceable and written right into the law's underwriting manual for the FHA and VA read this. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, 
It's necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. Segregation written right into the law. And here's the racist idea to justify it. And I wonder how many people still kind of hold this idea. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in home values. And yet the FHA, federal government, no private institution had ever done any research on anything to do with whether or not a black person living in a neighborhood would lower home values. It goes on to say in the 1939 underwriting manual, they update it to make sure that if you're going to build any new suburban development, you better have racial restrictions um, of barring people of color from living in those homes. Without, you can't get financing to buy your materials up front. You have to buy the land, put these deed restrictions in, or else no, 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 nothing can happen for you. So the Levitt brothers who built all of the Levitt towns, they have racial restrictions on every single deed and all of their materials were handed to them through massive government subsidies. They go even farther though in the underwriting manual to say that protect, protective barriers should be put into place to make sure that inharmonious racial groups do not infiltrate business um, and uh, white neighborhoods. In fact, they say high-speed traffic arteries, wide street parkways, and even just parks and rivers um, should be in places that separate black and white neighborhoods, which is why you have um, the U of R in a blue-lined area and Corn Hill is a red-lined area. It's, it has a lot to do with where the inner loop and 490 was built, as you'll see later. But we, we've looked at these laws, and, and I think it's important sometimes because we want to just say Racists are like ignorant people. Racists are like people from the South, like a George Wallace uh, or someone in a Charlottesville march. But Ibram Kendi and Stamp from the beginning challenges us to think differently about it. It's more these FDRs. It's these Senator Wagners from New York State. He writes time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas in order to justify the racist policies of their era like redlining and racial restrictions. And so you wanna talk about race. The author writes, the ultimate goal of racism was the profit and the comfort of the white race, specifically of rich white men. And that's me, I'm a rich white man. My parent, my dad was a rich white man and so are my grandparents. And my grandparents became rich white men, um, both of them because in the 1950s and 60s, they received federally financed FHA and VA loans, 30 year mortgages where they got to put no money down up front. Meanwhile, people of color did not have access to these massively government subsidized loans. So what my grandparents were able to do is buy these homes, small homes at first, build equity, send my parents to college, sell their home for almost double what they paid for it, thanks to the government subsidy, um, use that money to buy a bigger house, and then use the equity from that house to help send me to college, to help buy me a car. And today I'm, I'm here giving this presentation. I have no debt except for a mortgage. I'm a, I'm a public school teacher. I'm college educated with a master's degree and I'm able to give this kind of a presentation. And you can see how that wealth is built from generation to generation. And it's built on the backs of racist policies like the National Housing Act of 1934. And the way they enforced the segregation in this act was through something that many people are starting to hear this word and understand a little bit better called redlining. And redlining means that every city in the country was assessed by real estate agents trained by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, uh, which was part of the FHA. And what they did is they raided neighborhoods in every city to deem whether or not they could be invested in and who was allowed to live there. Green and blue neighborhoods uh, like Cobbs Hill or Pittsburgh in the far right corner there, uh, or the 19th Ward or uh, West Rondequoit, those were deemed best. White people live there, upper class, um, bankers, lawyers, et cetera, doctors. Yellow lined areas meant declining, usually older housing stock, closer together homes, day laborers, or maybe second generation immigrants. Whereas a red lined area meant Italians and Jewish people, black people, or toxic chemicals and factories were maybe in those neighborhoods. To give you an example, this is what I show my students. We compare and contrast these different neighborhoods. I don't, I don't tell them up front about what's going on. I, I have them look at, compare and contrast and try to draw their conclusions from this work. If you look at Corn Hill here, it says on the report, 75% black, 10% foreign, and the foreign nationality is Italian. And that this neighborhood is not being infiltrated. In fact, it's already been infiltrated. Where other neighborhoods like Beechwood where I live, Beechwood was 99% white, um, but it had like 1% Italian coming in. So it was labeled infiltrated. And except for the part of Beechwood where I live uh, by school 33 that has racial restrictive covenants, um, you couldn't really get a mortgage to improve your home in those areas. 
Whereas this is Pittsburgh, East Avenue Estates, right next to Oak Hill that has those racial restrictive covenants. You'll notice it says business in white collar, incomes up to $6,000, zero foreign families and zero people of color. The suburbs were all green lined. In fact, to illustrate just how green lined and segregated the suburbs were by this federal policy, in 1960, the most integrated suburb of Monroe County was Henrietta, where 11 individual people of color lived, including Dr. Walter Cooper, who was one of the heads of the NAACP. He and some of his friends, they got together and they specifically targeted Henrietta and moved in together to face the violence and the move in violence that they faced um, and that opposition to make sure that they could try to stay there and take a stand against that segregation. Most other suburbs, that didn't really happen until the 70s, 80s, or even the 90s. In The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, he gives us some facts to help us put how much of an impact these programs had nationwide. Rothstein writes that the FHA and VA insured half, half of all new mortgages nationwide during this period. In fact, the FHA and VA gave out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance across the United States. And of that $119 billion, 35 million families benefited from these incredible government subsidies through the FHA and VA backed loans, like this white family pictured on the left. And 98% of them were white. Let that statistic sink in. And think about the amount of wealth, and family and generational wealth that was brought to these 35 million white families. So we want to say, okay, Rochester is the home of Frederick Douglass. We're different. I'm sure people resisted in Rochester, but it was federal policy, so we, we couldn't resist it. When in fact, the opposite is true. And what was going on in the education system at almost all of the schools including Pittsburgh, including Penfield, Webster, RCSD, Honeyway Falls, was something called a blackface minstrel show. Um, it was uh, something that happened every spring in almost all of these school districts, town halls, Kiwanis clubs, rotary clubs, um, and fire departments. These were big at the fire departments and the Grange halls. And what you had was three main characters in a minstrel show. You had Jim Crow, you had Jim C-O-O-N, and you had Jim Dandy, um, and they would mock the intelligence of people of color. They would blacken their faces, paint on garish lips, um, and cartoon and clown people of color. And just this, this heinous racist thing. You can see these kids on the front page of the Honeyway Fall Times in 1960. These kids are all still alive today, right? And you look at these kids, think about what they were taught. If you look underneath this picture, you can see the names of every child and of the moms who did the blackface makeup. This wasn't something people were ashamed of. This was segregation that they were proud of and they wanted to ensure that their children were taught. You can see the Catholic Church um, in Pittsburgh. They had their annual minstrel show at the town hall right in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, it, to me, that's just startling. This is 1953 where it was advertised. Um, same with the Masons who also had an annual minstrel show at the town hall uh, directed by John DeYoung. This is Allendale, Columbia, another Pittsburgh uh, school and institution, 1949 in full blackface. Um, I want to point out Daniel Beach of Harris Beach Law Firm in the middle, as well as uh, John McGuckin. Uh, there's a McGuckin soccer field named after him. He's the boy in the, uh, in the middle on his knee. Uh, you can see Newark Junior High School, full blackface, horrendous image. Same at Kodak. The executives would put these shows on every year and proudly advertise them in their magazine that went out across the nation. You can see the kids of James Wiegand dressed up for the minstrel show. And my family's from Iowa and they never looked at Kodak and it's a different spelling, but it was too close. I, I had to put it in. Um, RIT, they had an annual minstrel show. And I remind you, RIT wasn't in Henrietta until the late 60s. They were in the redlined Third Ward. So RIT was surrounded by people of color. And it's fascinating that the all-white student body put these shows on every year in these majority Black neighborhoods where the institution was located. Here are the towns I found so far that hosted a Blackface show at least every year in each of these institutions. The NAACP condemned these shows. They had a campaign that lasted almost 10 years, writing letters to every school district, including Pittsburgh, um, asking them to cease and desist these racist shows. They published letters to the editor in the paper that I think really exemplify what's going on and what the problem is, and speaks to the attitudes of white supremacy in the Rochester community that would lead to people continuing being elected that um, were enforcing these segregationist federal policies. They write, blackface minstrel shows, must be banned from all public and private schools, 
churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all the dark skinned people of the world. Now, Racism was explicitly taught in our schools for, I mean, a century or more in, in, in Rochester. But then for the last 40 to 50 years, I don't know about you, but if you grew up in this community, growing up in Webster, I was taught nothing about racism. And that silence really was its own lesson, that we don't talk about it. I was taught to be colorblind, maybe if anything, not to see color, when in fact, that's something that's impossible to do. And I think now we're in a unique moment where we can start to own this history admit to who we've been in our past, talk about it, teach our kids how to talk about it, use restorative circles and practices to engage in these conversations and be a part of building better and more just school systems across our community and take a crack at this segregation and discrimination. Now, before we, we end, I have a few final things I wanna talk through. The first is the New York State Commission Against Discrimination in 1958. Now, a bunch of people of color helped get this report passed, activists like Howard Coles and Dr. Cooper. Um, and the report didn't necessarily help people. Um, it was sort of the response. We always say, let's talk about it, right? Is that familiar to anyone? You have a racist incident, let's talk about it. Let's have a report. Let's, let's start another committee to talk about it. And I mean, the NAACP had been trying to talk about it and make change for years. Another report comes out, not helpful for them, but super helpful for us today, because it shows us just how impactful these racist policies of redlining, racial restrictive covenants, and educational policies were during this time period. The report finds that in the 1950s, in Monroe County, 80% of people of color lived in the third and the seventh wards. It found that 1,600 units in both wards had either no bathroom or a shared bathroom, and more than 2,000 units, there was more than one person living in each room. In fact, Connie Mitchell ran to become the first publicly elected person of color in Monroe County because of the redlining and the overcrowding. She writes, we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there was not open housing. When John and I bought our house in Gregg Street, the real estate agent told us, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson Ave. They're just not open to black people. So we were confined from Jefferson Avenue back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. The report goes on to share this statistic, that 30% of all units, and this is 1958 when this gets published, had no running water. Howard Coles had found that almost 20 to 30 years prior, and yet the city and the county did nothing to make sure that this had changed. People like the Wells family were part of the 57 black families in the 50s who were able to get a home, not through the FHA, outside of the third and seventh ward. In fact, during this period of time, not a single person of color was able to get an FHA or VA loan in any suburb of Monroe County. So any new home being built in any suburb would have been whites only because of these federal policies. Pittsburgh commissioned a report in 2017, uh, a, a historic resource survey update done by Barrow Architecture, who found that the banking and lending practices uh, by the federal government promoted single family suburban housing. And because of this, they write, Pittsburgh experienced dramatic growth during this period. The census shows that from 1950 to 70, the population in Pittsburgh jumped from about 9,400 to over 25,000 residents, all of whom were white and all of whom had the benefit of those federal subsidies to allow them to build their homes. And here are some of those whites only developments that are listed in this Barrel Architecture Report. Some of you may see the neighborhoods that you live in. I'm gonna kind of go quickly through this. You'll be able to take a look at it afterwards. But originally when each of these housing tracts were built, again, they would have been whites only. And we know this because the commission report tells us that by 1958, not a single person of color had received an FHA mortgage. And it wasn't really until the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that people of color had access to FHA and VA loans. And the list goes on, right? Think about that growth. Another huge issue that happened during this period of time was called move-in violence. Um, and people of color uh, were reported all throughout Monroe County when they moved into a white neighborhood, violence happened. People signed petitions trying to get them to leave the neighborhood, calling them racial slurs, or sometimes like damage to their property, like the biases who bought a home in West Gerondequoit. Very quickly after they moved in, the Klan threw bricks through their front window, threatening them with death to burn their house down. They sold their home and they joined the Coopers and the Wells and the Lees out in Henrietta. 
They found in 58, again, no FHA loan given to a person of color in any of Rochester's suburbs. Meanwhile, people like Max Farish, builders like Norman Huck, Frank Drum, the head of the real estate board, and Fred Tosh, um, they acquired massive profits. Frank Drum made over 200 million by the 1970s um, in real estate. Here in the DNC in 1973 is an article about how Max Farish found $100 million just through building homes that were predominantly only allowed for people who were white to live, like Pine Hill in Pittsburgh. Meanwhile, you have urban renewal going on. This is another federal program that was just blatantly racist. Essentially, uh, local governments were given millions of dollars. Rochester was given over $30 million to build highways and to clear blight in red line neighborhoods um, and to help benefit businesses in these areas, specifically white business owners. And in order to do this, the neighborhoods that got knocked down were the predominantly black and red line neighborhoods. The seventh ward, 886 families were displaced, and in the third ward, over 850 families. You can see Plymouth and Troop Street. All of us have driven across the Susan B. Anthony Frederick Douglass Bridge, right over a highway that goes what, through what was a predominantly black neighborhood um, where there was thriving culture and business that was largely destroyed because of these things. On the right are the two men that were in charge of overseeing these policies. Elmer Milliman from Central Trust Bank, who was the head of the committee, and John Dale, um, the rehabilitation director and a city planner for, the, uh, for Rochester. These men would not allow Howard Coles, who was a housing expert, onto this committee, which was a public committee, even though he repeatedly tried to get on it. But because of his skin color, he wasn't allowed and these neighborhoods suffered greatly. One story that exemplifies this is the destruction of the social fabric that we saw in Ormond Street, where the Church of God in Christ, a black church uh, built in 1940, you can see the Reverend Caldwell, the founding pastor right there on the front steps in the seventh ward, um, was knocked down in the 1960s because Pepsi Cola Company um, had a small fire in their factory and were threatened to move to the suburbs. So Frank Staropoli Sr., the bald guy on the right, reached out to his friend Frank Lamb, the mayor at the time, who said, hey, we've got this $30 million. We're going to knock down this black neighborhood, a black church, and we'll subsidize your million-dollar Pepsi bottling factory, um, which today is still located right over where that church used to be. Um, meanwhile, that church never was able to buy a new building, and instead they rented oftentimes at a location on Lindhurst. Um, really, messing up the fabric of the neighborhood, a hub where people gathered uh, to find rest, um, to come together and to resist. Um, Frank Staropoli's son, Frank Staropoli Jr., um, he shared with me when I interviewed him um, that his father, um, nor his uncle or himself, ever hired a person of color to work in this Pepsi factory, even though it was in a majority um, black neighborhood. Now, this brings me to Rufus Farewell who at the same time of all this, the highways being built and urban renewal, he's locking up his gas station. And um, it's on Columbia Street, which is in the third ward, Plymouth Exchange area. And uh, the police think he's robbing it because he's a black man. And so he gets arrested and then beaten while he's handcuffed at the police station, so bad that he needs a wheelchair. And this is where we have our first massive protest against police brutality with over 300 people gathering in front of City Hall. But this wasn't the first time it had happened. It had happened more times. And this led to the 1964 uprising, a three-day protest or rebellion where over a thousand people were arrested, specifically in the third and seventh ward, those red line neighborhoods. And the number one reasons found by county historian Carolyn Vaca in 1989 as she combed through the arrest records and tied them to the census, found that people who had been displaced through urban renewal, the people who still didn't have running water, and people who had been directly affected by police brutality were the most likely folks to be arrested and to rise up in the streets. We can make some pretty direct connections to today. But here's the thing. Rochester wasn't alone. Almost every northern city in the United States had an uprising or a rebellion, just like ours. Um, and these things were happening all over the place. And the Kerner Commission found specifically that it was housing, it was job discrimination um, and police brutality that were leading to these problems. And then finally, 1968 hits, Martin Luther King is assassinated and Lyndon Johnson is able to ram through the Fair Housing Act of 1968, which eradicates redlining and makes racial restrictive covenants officially not forcible. And it gives HUD, um, which is now headed by Dr. Ben Carson, the task of enforcing the Fair Housing Act, giving them this 
this vague language. Their task is to affirmatively further fair housing. It doesn't say how they can do that, and it gives them almost no power, aside from being able to take away small amounts of HUD block grant funds from cities that are not affirmatively furthering fair housing. In fact, President Nixon actually ordered HUD Secretary George Romney to cease and desist and to not enforce the Fair Housing Act firing him after he tried to enforce it um, when he was up in uh, Michigan trying to do it. Um, white mayors across the country, including in upstate New York, reached out to the president to say, we do not want this enforced. Nixon ordered it, and his justification was this. A justification that I think you could heard be being made in a town just like Pittsburgh. Nixon writes, I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live for the most part in white neighborhoods and, or black neighborhoods and where there'll be predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools. Nixon is describing Monroe County, right? And he's describing the reaction of political leaders, including Bill Smith, who I know has gone on the record in, in several places saying he doesn't wanna socially engineer Pittsburgh, right? When in fact, Pittsburgh was socially engineered. You've seen the redlining maps and you've seen the racially restrictive covenants. The only way to undo those things is through anti-racist policies that allow for discrimination to not continue to happen and to make it so that towns like Pittsburgh are no longer 2% black. And that's part of up to us to be a part of that work and educating our children about this history so part of that work can happen. And the final piece of this is exclusionary suburban zoning. Connor Dwyer Reynolds, who's an instructor at Yale Law School, a good friend and a former uh, resident of Penfield, um, has actually written his whole like senior thesis for law school on the town of Penfield and its exclusionary suburban zoning policy that was enacted in the 60s. Now, up until the 60s, most suburbs, including Pittsburgh, had pretty lax zoning policies. I mean, aside from not putting a factory next to like a house or a smokestack. I mean, it was pretty, you could kind of do some of the things that you wanted. And largely you were protected because you had the racial restrictions and you had redlining. But you get civil rights coming, people start to get nervous. Uh, uh, Connor Reynolds has uh, gone through the records in these towns and he's found that large groups of citizens would come out to zoning board meetings like this all white Penfield zoning board meeting in 1965. And they would say, we want exclusionary zoning. Please make lot sizes bigger so that homes have to be more expensive, make it impossible to build affordable or low income housing or federally subsidized housing um, and make it so that we can keep our level of status. Again, the town engineered to make sure that a certain level of wealth and privilege is allowed to stay there. In fact, in Pittsburgh, they had similar such forums uh, against trailer parks or towers going up um, or restaurants that didn't quite fit the clientele. And you can see this, this meeting going on right here in the 60s. In fact, in 67, the city of Rochester spoke out against towns like Pittsburgh, um, saying that um, what was happening was racist and that these were intentional policies to keep these communities segregated and to kind of keep poverty in the city. Simo Scher, the city manager said, zoning ordinances are only a reflection of the willingness of communities surrounding Rochester to allow residential living for all income groups. And then now we have zoning today. The town of Pittsburgh, their comprehensive plan. I'm sure all of you are aware of the battle that went on last year um, and uh, what happened in regards to that that is not leading to integration in the town of Pittsburgh, which again is something I think is worth studying and looking into and figuring out what happened there and how do we build a more inclusive Pittsburgh, Penfield, Fairport, Webster, et cetera, and how do we undermine these policies that have created the incredible racial segregation that this census map shows is systemic across our community today, where the highest concentration of poverty are in the inner city and the greatest concentration of wealth are in Rochester suburbs, as designed by the federal government, state and local policymakers. The highest rates of owner occupancy are in those green line neighborhoods and not in those red lined. Same with home purchase denial rates. Same with how long you live, common ground health finding that how long someone lives varies by almost 10 years depending on what their zip code is. Um, and when it comes to food insecurity, I mean, there's not a single Wegmans in any red line neighborhood, only on East Ave, which was a green line neighborhood. You can see that on this map as well. And I encourage all of you to go onto Common Ground Health's website and check out some of this stuff. It's just shocking the way it lines up with redlining and housing discrimination. Same with asthma, the highest rates of asthma in those red line neighborhoods. Same with high blood pressure. Um, same with life expectancy, right? 
And then finally, nationwide, these policies have led to just a vast wealth gap. Yale finding in 17 that for every $100 the average white family has in wealth, the average black family has only $5. Um, and so as we close, I want to remind you of sort of that central thesis statement from James Baldwin. Baldwin wrote that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I hope that you were able to join me in facing these things the way Baldwin called us to, in facing uh, racial um, steering in the real estate industry, the way Howard Coles did, the way Judge Davis fought back against restrictive covenants. Eventually, Judge Davis actually won in the 19th Ward. A white person from the NAACP bought that home on Elmdorf Avenue and sold it to him through a private mortgage under the table. The way Connie Mitchell fought redlining in VA mortgages, the way urban renewal was fought in the streets by the thousands of people that erupted in rebellion. And hopefully some of you today will be a part of the fight to remove exclusionary suburban zoning policies that continue to segregate the greater Rochester community. And one of the things that gives me just so much hope is seeing every superintendent, including Michael Perro, sign this letter. Um, I think that was written by Dr. Sean Nelms at East High School, who's on my advisory committee for our curriculum project at Pathstone. And part of this letter is a shared stand that Monroe County districts will stand together against racism. And specifically, they will develop common curriculum that will focus on how race and see the underlying spot, class and inequities have shaped Monroe County from 1964 to today. That's talking redlining, uprising, police, it's all these things, it's zoning, and it's huge. And so what they're talking about is actually this partnership that we've developed with Pathstone. And so Dr. Nelms and many others are a part of this work. And the work that we've developed, it's something I've been doing on my own for about eight years and over the last two years in partnership with the Pathstone Foundation. I've gotten to train over 200 teachers across Monroe County in how to do this and hundreds of students and what um, this history is. And yet it's time to make this something that more and more people have access to and training to do this in a culturally responsive way where we're not telling kids what to think. Obviously in this presentation, you can hear my perspective and, and my opinion of how to interpret these historical events. But what we wanna do with our history curriculum about Rochester's untaught history of racism and resistance is we wanna expose kids to primary sources, give them the tools to read those primary sources critically, build their own inquiry questions and draw their own conclusions about what happened in Rochester when it comes to health and equity, wealth, income, and all of these things related to segregation by looking at the redlining map, the restrictive covenants, the oral histories, minstrel shows, and so many other sources that we pulled together. I wanna share this quick story about three of the girls in my class who a few years back went through this curriculum with me. They learned all these stories, they, they, just like you did um, today. And one of the reactions was to turn the lens on the Rush Henrietta School District, who is certainly not perfect. The girl in the middle, her name is Kalyat. And in fact, Kalyat comes to me after school one day and says, Mr. Wiegand, I think our school's racist. I kind of paused, I was like, what? tell me what you mean, Kalyat. She said, well, I've never had a black teacher. I've never had a teacher that looks like me. And I don't think that's fair. And I said, that's not fair. You're right, that's a racist policy, just like Dr. Kendi talks about, right? And she's like, well, let's go to the principal, let's fix this. And that kind of gave me pause and a little bit of terror that kind of went through my heart and soul. And then I remembered something, I was like, what did Howard Coles do? And she was like, well, he got his friends together and he did like a big research project and then a presentation and I was like, Let's do that first. And so she got Bailey on the left and Simra on the right. And every day at lunch for a month, the girls came up, they researched, they read all these different facts about uh, policies. They found that in Henrietta, we had 11 black teachers and 550 white teachers, the most in Monroe County. They found that Pittsford at the time had only one black teacher, which I think is still the case today, similar to the rest of the schools across Monroe County. So they made a presentation, they wrote a script, and then they wrote the cutest letter in the world to our principal, where it was like, dear Mr. Principal, we love you, and we wanna talk about a problem that we're noticing in our school district. And the principal was like, all right, you guys can come down during lunch. So the girls hit them hard with this presentation. And the guy's floored, white guy, he's not ready for it, right? I didn't, I didn't give him any warning. This was the girl's idea I just supported, right? He didn't know what to say. And he, he tried to explain, and they asked him, well, have you ever not hired a black person? And he was like, that I have. And they were like, well, why? He didn't have an answer. And then Kalyats quoted the statistics. She said, we found in our research that if a black child has one black teacher, their chance of graduation is 30% higher. Don't you want me to graduate? And 
I mean, my heart's sitting over in the corner and it's just like breaking as I'm seeing these girls be so brave and speak up. And then they got to speak to the assistant superintendent of hiring, to the school board and the superintendent. And I'm proud to report that this year is the first year that Rush Henrietta has officially formed partnerships with three historically black colleges in Atlanta and are starting a feeder pattern to bring more black teachers into the Rush Henrietta school district. And it all started with these girls learning the history of their community, understanding how people fought back here and taking those lessons and engaging in civic action to build the community that they wanted to be a part of and the school system that they felt they deserved. And so what we have done to make this the kind of thing that's not just these four, three girls, so the kids in my class and some others, but to be something that countywide kids have access to, because imagine what an eighth grader could do with this stuff, or an 11th or a 12th grader, and the ways they could create change in your town and across our county. So we've gotten together this incredible team, people like Kevin Beckford from the Pittsburgh Town Board, Jackie Campbell from Rock the Future, Walter Cooper, who you got to see in the presentation. He's been calling me every week to help me write curriculum and tell me new stories. Ashley Gant, who's been one of the main leaders of the Black Lives Matter protests. Joan, uh, Joan Howard Coles, Howard Coles' daughter and also an editor of the Black newspaper in Rochester, as well as the dean of the Werner School, teachers from RCSD, social studies directors, superintendents from Webster, Fairport, my superintendent, or not Fairport, um, uh, East High School, Wade Norwood, a New York State Regent and CEO of Common Ground Health, and my superintendent, Bo Wright, and RH. Because what we want to do is to create something that we can adapt for each school district that's going to make a huge difference in helping kids learn their story, both in our community and specific to their town. And so we've developed this project, partnered with Pathstone, and our aim is to start writing curriculum in July and be ready to publish and start training teachers countywide in the fall. We've got a ton of teachers lined up who are excited to be a part of this work and some other great leaders who are going to be participating. Um, and you can actually support this work. You can go to this link that you see on the screen. You can learn more about the curriculum and you can make a donation. And what I want to do, and when I was invited, they, they told me that I, I, could, I could share this is I really wanna ask you from the bottom of my heart to please support this work, um, to, to make a donation of what you feel this project is worth and to think about the value that this might add to the Pittsford School District as well as the city and all across our county. That if kids could learn this story, to learn how people resisted in our community and to be a part of actively building the county of Monroe that they wanna live in, I challenge you to please join me in um, going to this website and supporting our work. We have a number of foundations that have put uh, generous donations towards the project. Um, we're over half the way there and we're looking to just be able to have lots of parents and teachers also say this is important to us and to vote with their dollars and say this is a project we want. And I'm gonna share the link in the chat in just a second. Finally, some other ways you can take action are advocate for these kinds of policies in the district when it comes to hiring, enrollment, reporting, um, when it comes to teaching this history, you're gonna have to hold the school board and the superintendent accountable. This stuff is uncomfortable. Parents aren't gonna necessarily want all of this to be taught. I've had several parents write me letters that aren't the nicest about some of this stuff. And yet every time I've been able to solve those problems because my superintendent has had my back and because my teachers and my community and my union has had my back and has said, this is something that's important. We're gonna do it in a way that's culturally responsive. That's not forcing a doctrine on kids, but that's just teaching them the facts and letting them grapple with it in a safe and supportive way. You can support organizations like the City Roots Community Land Trust um, that reinvest in previously redlined neighborhoods like Beechwood advocate for anti-racist zoning policies. I'm pretty sure one of your planning board members, Justin Lightgeb, was on this call. Reach out to that guy. I'd love to hear more from him. Um, advocate the city, county, and state to talk about the housing crisis. We had 9,000 evictions last year in Rochester, 9,000 evictions, and yet it's almost like no one's talking about that. How can 9,000 people get kicked out of their home and the rest of the community just sits by? We got to talk about that. You can support the citywide tenant union, the incredible work they're doing out of St. Mary's and St. Joe's, as well as the homeless union. And finally, I think reparations has to be something that we talk about is included on the table. So my final question to all of you that I want to open our discussion with is this. How do we make some of this work happen in Pittsburgh? How do we, how do we make it so that your students have access to this history, have the chance to engage with it, talk about it, and understand their story and their community stories better. So what I wanna do um, is open up the floor uh, for people to sort of share out. Feel free to ask questions, share comments, but also to continue to focus on this central question. 
how do we make this work happen in Pittsburgh? How do we build a more just and equitable Pittsburgh and Monroe County? And what can the people on this virtual meeting do to organize and be a part of this very um, important work? Thank you so much for having me and I'm really excited to have this conversation. All right, do people wanna uh, write questions in the chat or do the raise hand feature? And then Mark, uh, you can help me kind of call on different people to share. Sure. And I will express that we really don't want speeches. I don't, I don't wanna hear a five to 10 minute speech from someone. Please try to keep your comments one to two minutes. Uh, we'd really appreciate a commitment to brevity um, so we can hear from the most people and really build um, some momentum and some great conversation around this. And if someone is talking too long, I will very respectfully let you know and move on to somebody else. Um, can I get a thumbs up from everybody if that works for you for how we can lead this conversation? And if you're able, it'd be amazing to be able to see all of you. Um, for the conversation portion of this. So if you're willing to turn on your screen, that'd be fantastic. If you can't, totally understand. Um, but uh, go ahead. Mark, did you have something to, to share first? No. Or Lin oh, was that Linda Beckford wanted to share Linda first? Beckford has her hand raised. We, do, we did actually also have some questions that came up. Oh, great. Um, so I don't know if we want to do the questions first and then go to Linda or... You know, that'd be great. Why don't you just share some of those questions from the chat and then we'll go right to Linda. Um, so there was a question about, do you feel that the real estate agents in Rochester know much about redlining? Uh, I know that um, they, they learn about it maybe in a tiny little piece of their training uh, to be, get their real estate license. But my understanding from a number of real estate friends in the area that uh, it's pretty lax and it's definitely not Rochester specific. And the history of uh, real estate steering and blockbusting in Rochester is almost actively avoided is my understanding. Although if you're a realtor and you know anyone at GRAR, uh, we just sent in for a $10,000 grant for this project. So call your friends over there, Jim Yackel, whoever, and let them know if you think this is something that they should uh, support. Because I think we definitely wanna make this happen. And I've gotten to speak to the women's group of realtors a couple years ago and share this presentation with them. So that was really exciting to get to do. What else? Um, the next question says, are there any towns, villages in Monroe County that have not been found to have restrictive covenants or was this common across the board? Common across the board. We found them in every single suburb at this point so far. A little less in rural areas, um, but that was more because you really didn't have big developments in rural areas. People kind of built their own houses, I guess. Um, but pretty much every single town. Webster is the only town where I haven't found the actual deeds but I've had, I'd say 10 or 15 people send me an email and be like, my deed has one of those. I live on, you know, shoe craft or I live off a of Clem. Um, so it's a pretty good chance that anytime between the twenties and the forties, most of these towns are guaranteed to have quite a few of these. Arondequoit is the most with several thousand at this point. Thanks. And, the next one says, um, what are the most effective ways to bring more people of color into our suburbs now? changing zoning laws, allowing multifamily residences, for example, creating housing grants. Are there any suburbs of other cities that have taken effective steps towards reversing the systemic damage? Uh, great question. I would say first, um, exclusionary zoning has to end. We have to change that. We have to rewrite comprehensive plans um, to allow for integration, diversity, and a variety of incomes. Because I would say that living in a community uh, that has diversity, both of race and income, to me is a better and more beautiful place to live. Um, and it allows for those kinds of interactions in the classroom uh, that I think are just incredible for me as a teacher, teaching in uh, what I think is the most integrated suburb, which is uh, Henrietta, um, as well as Gates Trilai, which is really interesting in Gates. They've had a number of affordable housing projects get built uh, through Litech, whereas Pittsburgh, there haven't been any. Um, same with Penfield, you know, there's been a pretty active resistance against those things. Um, and then of the affordable housing that's been built, because oftentimes you have a big fight for like a really small affordable housing project, like the Pines of Parenton, which in fact hasn't really diversified Pit, uh, Fairport much at all. And um, when you look at the actual statistics, it's, it's very small amounts of people of color live in that area. And oftentimes those projects like Phillips Village, which were subsidized by the federal government, um, were in part largely built to help older white residents who could no longer afford the taxes in those towns have some place to live, which I understand is a, uh, an issue out in uh, Pittsburgh as well. 
So I think you have to look at those zoning codes. You have to look, go back through those town records and minutes and look at the people who spoke and some of the racial underlying and underpinnings that came from some of that piece. Um, and I also think you have to start to ask and think what kind of community do we wanna live in? And if we're gonna do it, let's do it right. And let's, let's do some widespread sweeping policies that make a big difference. And it can't just be local. The town board and your zoning board I believe truly have a moral obligation to do something about this, but the federal government also has to take a direct role. Um, reparation was never made for redlining, ever. If you've read the ta Coates case for reparations, it, it lays out it's not just slavery that people of color um, were, like, should get reparations for, it's this. I mean, my family got thousands and thousands of dollars thanks to those federal subsidies, and the majority of black families did not get that, even the veterans. And I think, to me, that's a wrong that just has to be corrected. Any other ones from the chat before we go to Linda? Um, yep, there's a few more. Mm -hmm. So both Parrington and Fairport are updating their comprehensive plans over the next year. What specific changes would you recommend to help encourage greater racial diversity in these areas? Um, I would say they definitely need to reach out to groups like Pathstone um, about talking how to, they can build um, low income housing or mixed, really mixed income housing um, so that you, you create diversity, and, but also not just like, like a big tower, but spread out. So it's not segregated the way the Pines are, or Phillips Village is kind of off in a little corner siloed from the rest of the town. How do you do it in a way that it really naturally fits into the community? Some of the things that Richard Rothstein has talked about that are really incredible are towns could easily buy homes in the neighborhood. They could create a community land trust, um, which has a ground lease that limits the sale price of the home. Um, these are completely legal. I'm on the board of the City Roots in the Rochester, and this is what we do all the time. Um, you could do that out in the suburbs to make it so these homes are directly for people who make below 50 to 30 percent of the area median income. Um, and you could just, you could turn them into two family homes and make it so that more folks could live and easily just integrate into the communities. I know uh, Habitat for Humanity is interested in doing these kinds of things, um, but zoning boards uh, have made it pretty impossible to have any kind of multifamily homes um, built into any of these residential neighborhoods. I think that's a big um, important piece for them to think about, but I would really encourage uh, parents in Fairport to take a deep dive into that, their own history and then to start thinking about like with the end in mind, how, like what do we want numbers wise, what would be diversity in our community? And then specifically housing wise, what do we have to look at? And what's that bold vision that we can organize around? And then I'd make sure your kids know this stuff and include them in this conversation. Ask them to what kind of Fairport school they wanna to go to. Do they wanna to go to a school with no black teachers where they don't sit by students of color and miss out on those things? Where <laughs> me, I go to college and I'm directly confronted by students of color. I never sat by a black student in class ever in my life. And I'm having a black student tell me after a class, what you said was racist. And I was like, I'm not a racist, I don't see color. And she's like, that's racist. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I felt this embarrassment and I felt like I hadn't been prepared to live in this multicultural world that we live in. Great question. Could probably talk for two more hours about that, but I won't. So I'm actually gonna let Linda go because the next couple Beautiful. of questions came after Linda's hand raise. Great. Um, so go ahead. It looks like it's Kevin. Hi. <laughs> yeah, L Linda and I are here. We're actually, we're, we had just taken a little bit of a, a break uh, to eat dinner. And so we're actually listening to you from a parking lot of uh, a restaurant. <laughs> nice. So, uh, and so Shane, listen, I actually, uh, two things. Uh, one is for you and one is for everybody that's listening. Uh, every time I hear your presentation, I learn something new each time because it evolves. And, and, uh, and I love how you, you know, add additional content to really sort of make it relevant and recent. And I see some things in there that I didn't see before that really helps to inform me. Uh, and, and to everybody on the call, if you're from Pittsburgh, um, you know, I want you to know a lot of the things you've heard me share at our town board meeting and in the community is from Shane and reading the book, Call of Law. <clears throat> so quite honestly, you know, um, anything that you can do to help better support what I've been trying to do on the town board, we actually have the majority now on the board and should be able to drive certain changes, but this can't be a push, it has to be collaborative because there are a lot of folks that need to understand our history and to be able to understand why there's a moral reason why we need to do more than what we're doing today. And that when you hear terms like, um, uh, attract the right kind of diversity. It's a racist thought, a racist idea. When you hear terms that um, keep the character of Pittsburgh, that gets right out of one of those flyers that you just showed, 
that Shane just shared with you. Oh that yeah, was that Pittsburgh uh, to have desirable 50. social character, which explicitly yeah. meant white in the deed restriction. The yeah, Orb Town Supervisor said that openly in camera that was on the news um, last year when I was trying to put the amendment through. The amendment I was looking to put into our comp plan wasn't a, a, a law, it was essentially language that said that we were gonna be committing to creating more socially economically diverse neighborhoods like a Wood Creek, but more of them. Uh, and so um, there's a tremendous amount of lack of awareness around the history that Shane just shared. And so I love the fact that you're videoing this because what we can do is um, have some community shares. In fact, I'm gonna throw out a kind of a call to action. If you're watching this today, once this recording is available, host a watch, watch party on Facebook. Get together people who normally don't understand. In fact, folks that are normally critics of this, have them listen to this and then have a discussion with them afterwards. The more people we can educate, and I got this directly from Richard Rothstein, because when I told him that I lived in Pittsburgh and I was concerned that we had done this, he says, you absolutely did. You're, you were the poster child for actually putting these type of things in place uh, while you're at 2% today. I said, well, how do we fix it? He said, you won't like my answer. You have to educate people first, because if you don't educate them, it's gonna be more of a push than more of a collaborative move. And, and I, I, I didn't necessarily believe that at the time because I thought this is common sense. Once you read the book, once I tell you it's happened, we'll make it happen. And sure enough, last year, I couldn't. I couldn't get it done because I need more people in Pittsburgh to understand our own history and then to figure out what we can do to make that change happen. So um, that's my call to action to you is to share this video, have a watch party, and go from there. All right. I really Thank you, Shane. I appreciate that, Kevin. And I, uh, I would love to come to your, your, instead of a watch party, I'd be happy to just come and share again um, with friends or a small group. I've given this talk over 150 times, um, usually just to, to share it because I believe this is really important for us to know as a community. Uh, who's next? So the next question says, um, as we prepare to update our zoning codes, can you recommend resources? Yeah, I would definitely reach out to Pathstone. I know they'd have a lot to say, and I'd also definitely re reach out to uh, Connor uh, Dwyer Reynolds, and I would read his uh, report on this, which I am, oops, I just only sent something to Wendy. Sorry, Wendy. Uh, ooh, Connor, Connor Reynolds is his name. And uh, it's actually in a, a, a recent Justin Murphy article, and I'll add the, the file right now to the chat that goes into the history of zoning codes he is a lawyer who is an expert in zoning, specifically exclusionary zoning. I'd say he's the expert in the country. Um, reach out to, to him. If you reach out to me for his email, I can definitely give it to you. I know he would absolutely love to be a part of this. He's been really involved in our work. And I'm just going to try to pull that up while we talk. Great question. You want me to go on to the next one? Yes. What are your thoughts on the urban suburban program? Uh, urban Suburban to me is incredibly problematic. I recommend that everyone read uh, Striving in Common by Kara Finnegan, um, which I just added to the chat. Uh, she's a, a researcher at the U of R uh, who got a huge grant to systemically study Urban Suburban. Urban Suburban uh, is something that allows suburban districts like Pittsburgh to close their budget gaps. Um, so Pittsburgh school budget would really struggle to uh, meet its uh, bottom line if it weren't for the backpacks full of ca cash that the students of color bring um, out of the city school district, disinvesting from the city yet again to reinvest in Pittsburgh schools. Um, and of course, a small number of students of color do benefit. And in many ways, that can be great for those students. I've, some, some of my friends have told me that participate in urban suburban in Pittsburgh or Webster or Brighton that it was a really powerful, positive experience for them. Um, they, were allowed, they were able to meet a, a group of people that were completely different from their hyper-segregated neighborhood in the inner city. They have access to people who served on boards of directors and were professors at colleges, to be able to get letters of recommendation that allowed them to get into schools that they couldn't have if they didn't have that social networking connection. But meanwhile, it's around eight or 900 kids that are able to benefit um, and in no way is that meaningful segregation. And then oftentimes, those kids aren't able to participate in sports in the district unless their parent has access to a vehicle to be able to drive out and pick them up because the suburban districts often refuse to bus those students um, back to their school. Um, what I would recommend is that we really explore a regional approach to education like Kara Finnegan lays out and Justin Murphy has done a great job talking through, um, as well as uh, the folks at a number of different institutions have been talking about this kind of thing, especially Nicole Hannah-Jones, reading her work on this, I also think um, would be crucial. 
Okay, so for, thank you for that one. For the next one, I'm actually gonna unmute um, Justin. Um, it's Great. his question and it's, I want him to ask it, it's kind of lengthy. Mm -hmm. oh. Hi, Shane, thank you very hey, much for doing this, this presentation, first of all. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Great. Uh, I, I just wanted to clarify, um, I think that based on some of the, the questions and, and discussion, um, it seems like there there might be some confusion between um, racial restrictive covenants, which are something that's recorded in the deed to a property, um, and exclusive zoning, which is uh, what is written by town and, and village boards. Um, and I, I just wanna, in order to obtain the best results and, and uh, create some kind of a change, it seems like it might be useful to distinguish these two things. You know, restrictive covenants are something that you'd have to change in individual property uh, ownership records, um, whereas exclusive zoning is really what we want to deal with in terms of municipalities. Um, does that does that sound right to you? And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the zoning is uh, a kind of a tool to keep a certain level of income and uh, price for home structure, whereas a restrictive covenant is specifically race based um, and was officially made illegal in 1968. Thank you so much for that, Justin. So the next question will be from Maya. Hold on one second, I'm gonna meet her. There you go. Hey, Maya. Hi, how are you doing? Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I should just say, I, well, I spent a long time working in housing, so I feel like this was after my own heart. I appreciate you very much for this. Oh, good. <laughs> but I wanted to ask, actually, because a couple of friends uh, are also on this call, but we um, helped to put together that petition for Pittsburgh schools to- Oh, that, that Maya, great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I an email, but glad to meet you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I am so grateful for the opportunity to start this conversation. And so I'm curious whether there's this conversation has happened with Pittsburgh schools at all and sort of what the progress of that might be, whether even there's been focus amongst like grade levels or just even how the appetite for this conversation, you know, has, has been um, as you've been starting it. Maya, let me first say, I just so appreciate your work. I, I hope that students in school districts across our county also do what you did, because that to me is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I hope that this continues and that more people sign that petition. And if you can share that petition in the chat, that would be fantastic. I'm sure many here have signed already. Um, so Pittsburgh's been interesting. I've had a number of teachers reach out to me privately uh, over the last two years to say, uh, we don't feel like our district would bring you to do a training in this, but could we meet with you offline at a coffee shop or over Zoom and we'll, you know, maybe chat and you can kind of talk about your curriculum and we'll figure out some ways to kind of slip it into the things we've been doing, which is what I did in Henrietta. I didn't really have permission in Henrietta. I just started doing it and didn't tell anybody. I got tenure. And then I went on Evan Dawson and I told everyone I was doing it and the feedback was really positive. Then it was too late. You know, so you kind of got to organize around these kind of things. Um, I've gotten to have uh, recently, I got to talk to uh, one of your social studies directors. And we had a fantastic conversation um, where I got to outline the specific curriculum that I've been using um, and talk about what we're hoping to do this summer um, and express that I would absolutely love to come and do a training. Um, my understanding is that training is on pause uh, right now. So I'll be really happy when Pittsburgh starts some policy changes with hiring, um, with the curriculum, that, like what you're proposing and this work that I'm trying to do, as well as Dr. Nelms. And so I'm really excited because with, with Dr. Nelms um, and the work that he's doing at the Werner School and at East High School, that he's on our board. He's directly helping us do this work. And I, uh, I'm, my understanding is your superintendent signed that letter saying that they want to teach the history of 64 to today. Um, and I'm just so excited and I, I hope I get to meet with him. Um, I would love to have your superintendent join our advisory committee or your social studies director. And I'd love for Pittsburgh to just be a poster child and be piloting this next fall or next spring and send teachers to some of these trainings. In fact, we're going to pay teachers to do this if we can get our funding fully funded and tailor our trainings to be specific to the school district and their, their resources. So that's what our hope is. Um, but again, you gotta hold people accountable. And there's, there is a strong group of voices in every, in every town of parents that do not want their kids to learn about this. Um, and they don't, none of them think they're racist or would say they're racist. There's just, nope, it's just not appropriate for our kids. You know? Whereas when I, when I talked to my kids in fourth grade about George Floyd two weeks ago, 
Um, I mean, the, the students of color in my class, they're crying, they're scared. They know about the news. And I'm sitting there like, man, it, this is so hard. I'm using my best restorative practices. We're using our feelings chart. We're passing that talking piece. Like we're, we're, we're reading poems that help connect and at a culturally responsive and developmentally appropriate level. Um, and I, I feel grateful though, that when we had that conversation about George Floyd, we'd already learned about slavery. We'd already learned about how policing originated with slave patrols. We'd already learned about Rufus Farewell and redlining. And so it helped them understand that larger context and have that conversation better. And I really think in Pittsburgh, as in every district, kids are gonna come back to school in the fall and they're gonna say, what happened? People just protested in the streets. People of color in Rochester are dying at three times the rate of white folks because of COVID-19. How is this possible? And if we don't have an answer for our students, I just, I don't, I don't know how we can feel okay with ourselves. And so what we really hope to do with Past One Foundation and this curriculum project is to, to do that for students in a way that's responsive, supportive, um, that's not antagonistic, and is a way that I, I think is just sharing the history and the facts. So awesome question and keep up the great work, Maya. And we've got to talk soon. I know <laughs> Justin emailed and connected us. So we got to make sure that happens. Thank you. I'm hoping next week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maya. The last question that I have so far in the chat um, is, can you share again the timeline to have the anti-racist curriculum prepared and ready to start training teachers? So the timeline is this, it starts, um, well, we've already got a fourth grade curriculum built and no one had to pay for that. That was just me and my friends in Rush Henrietta and people like Dr. Cooper and Steve Lamort at the city school district and a bunch of others that just wanted to help for free. But to make this something that's truly an institutional change, um, we have to raise some funds. We need some support. We need a backbone. Um, and that's what Past One's going to do. And so we're on, the, on track to raising our funds. Our goal is the first week of July to be fully funded. Um, and again, that's going to be up to the folks um, in, in, this, in this chat uh, who decide if they want to support this. And, and I really challenge you, if you would share, if you're passionate about this and want this to happen, please share the link. Um, to the page that tells more about the project and offers the chance for people to financially support and vote with their dollars. That's going to be huge for allowing us to start that second week of July and hire the teachers that we need to hire to do this training and be a part of the pilot. We've already been meeting um, off the books with the Werner School and the evaluators there, as well as a bunch of program development professionals um, at the Werner School and at BOCES um, to help design um, that PD. And I've already piloted this a number of times, so we really hope um, that we're going to be able to pilot this in at least five school districts starting in September to October. But again, that'll depend on your support. And um, I'd love to answer your questions or talk with you more. And you can definitely reach out to me um, or you can reach out uh, on the on the Pathstone page. There's a link uh, to the some folks that you can email our team, Brennan and Stuart. Pretty sure Stuart's on too. I don't know if Stuart wants to add more about this. There he is. I don't know if, can we unmute Stuart? I'll let Stuart get a quick share. Hey, Stuart. We are on mute. We unmute no, you. She, um, Shane, you're remarkable. Oh, you're great too, Stuart. Look at this. <laughs> we could go back no. and forth uh, for the next hour. No, no, no. <laughs> I, think what you're, I think what you're witnessing from, uh, from Shane is uh, the kind of energy and commitment that the new generation is making to become an anti-racist. And that's what this is about. So we're at Pass on our proud, thrilled, to share in this with him and to bring this to the suburbs. And Shane mentioned that we have been trying to build affordable housing in the suburbs for 50 years. And we've got about three projects that we can speak, can point to, and one of which is in Gates that, that, that Shane mentioned. It's mm -hmm. been very difficult because of restrictive zoning, because of NIMBY, because we have not been able to generate the kind of support that we need from the community to back down the, the racists who don't want this to happen. So, the more we can have this conversation, the more we believe, and that's why we're putting our effort into this, that we can educate people, we have a much better shot at getting support than we have the old way. You know, we can sue people and we can be in court for 10, 15 years and not get it done, or we can try and create champions who want to get it done and will do it themselves, and then we'll be there to help do the technical. We can, we can do the technical work, we can get the funding, we know how to get all that to happen. We need dirt, we need land. We need commitment to get buildings put together. So I just appreciate very much your willingness to be a part of this. 
thank you all so much for having me and thank you for sharing that Stuart and uh, please reach out and uh, I'm just so excited to get to share some of this work um, and hear your great questions and conversation and I'm even feeling very hopeful um, about the future that we're going to build together so thank you all and uh, have a great evening farewell thank you everybody for thank joining you. us tonight thank you Shane